Welcome to Electron Line. Here's an example that we sometimes struggle with is uh, the inclined plane, a pulley, we have two masses. And usually the problem is set up where there's an acceleration in one direction or the other. If the small m is large enough, the whole system will accelerate in this direction. If the small m is small enough, the whole system will accelerate in the opposite direction. But what if it's in between? What if the little m is just so that it will not accelerate in one direction nor in the other direction? So for that we have to figure out what the maximum and minimum value the little m can be in order to prevent the system from accelerating or from starting to accelerate. And so we're going to do this in two parts. First of all, we're going to figure out what is the maximum m can be to prevent the whole system of accelerating in this direction. So the thing is, the larger you make m, the more likely it is for the acceleration to be in this direction. But in this case, you don't want to accelerate in that direction. So what is the maximum value the small m can be? All right, the way to do that, again, is to identify all the forces acting on the system. So obviously, we have the small mg pulling this way, which is going to try and accelerate the system. We have the large mg pulling in this direction. And that, of course, since it's on the inclined plane, we have to divide this into the two components, the perpendicular component and the horizontal component. So this here would be m, oh, that would be large mg. Let's change that. That would be large mg times the cosine of theta, because this angle theta here is the same as that angle. And here this would be the mg times the sine of theta, because it's opposite. That's the opposite component to the angle. All right, let's see. We still have the friction force as well, so we're going to find the normal force, and that should have been a straight line. Let's try this again. How about a straight line going straight up? There we go. Well, it's a little closer. So the normal force, and in this case, the normal force is going to be equal to the opposite force, equal to this, which is mg times the cosine of theta. And realizing that if there was no friction at all, the small mass would accelerate the whole system in this direction, so the friction force will point in the opposite direction, so the friction force will find the acceleration. So force friction is equal to the normal force times mu, and the normal force is identified as mg cosine theta, and of course, times mu. And in this case, it's going to be the static coefficient of friction. The reason for that is because we don't want the, the system to accelerate. We want it to be, remain stationary. So now that we've identified all of the forces, now we can use the following equation. We can say that F net is equal to the mass total times acceleration, so the total mass of the system times acceleration. But since we don't want to accelerate, we're going to set that equal to zero because acceleration is equal to zero, which means that the net force, F net, is going to be equal to zero. So now we have to identify all the forces that would aid acceleration if there was one, minus all the forces that oppose the acceleration. So in the direction of motion of the system, we see that this would be aiding the acceleration if there was acceleration, these two forces will be opposing the acceleration if there was an acceleration. So therefore, we can say that F net is equal to zero, and so that becomes mg, small mg, that's trying to get the whole system to accelerate, minus the big mg times the sine of theta, which is finding the acceleration, and minus the mg cosine of theta times mu sub s, which is also fighting the acceleration, and all those added together become the net force must equal to zero. Remember what we're looking for is we're looking for the maximum that m can be, so we have to solve that equation for little m. We're going to move this over to the other side, so we have mg is equal to positive mg times the, oop, that should be the sine of theta, sine of theta plus mg times the cosine of theta times mu sub s. Notice all terms have a g in it, so the g's can cancel out. And we could potentially factor out an m here, so little m equals big M times the sine of theta plus the cosine of theta times mu sub s. And now we're ready to plug in some values to see what that mass actually would be. So this is equal to I believe it's 20 kilograms for the big mass, 
multiplied times the sine of theta. We said theta was 30 degrees, so the sine of 30 degrees plus the cosine of 30 degrees multiplied times mu sub s, which is 0 0.2, like that. And now we're ready. Oop, I guess I should finish it with a square bracket. And now let's see what that is equal to. So 30 times uh, the cosine times 0 0.2. Multiply, oh, add that to the sine of 30, which is plus 0.5, and multiply that times 20. And the maximum that can be is 13.5, so that would be 13.5 kilograms. Which means that in order to get the whole system to accelerate in that direction from a resting position, you have to overcome the static coefficient of friction, which means the mass would have to be at least, or a little bit over, 13.5 kilograms to get the whole system to accelerate. Of course, once the whole system begins to accelerate, then you would need less force to keep it going, uh, because then the coefficient of friction will become kinetic coefficient of friction, which is usually less, and the whole system, of course, would accelerate at a large acceleration. But the minimum mass required 13.5 kilograms to get the whole system going. On our next example, we're going to show you what the value of m can be so that it will prevent the whole system from sliding or accelerating in the opposite direction. So you can see how that would work out when you work it out in that way. So stay tuned for our next video to see what that looks like in the opposite direction. And that's how it's done.